<laughs> Y'all know what it is. Hey everyone, and welcome back to a surprising episode of Eggs Classics. This week we're featuring Grant Aldrich, the founder and CEO of OnlineDegree.com. After graduating from school with a mountain of debt on his shoulders, Grant made it his mission to make college more accessible and affordable for everyone. Prior to launching his website, Grant spent his entire career working in startups with more than 15 years of experience and two prior exits to publicly traded companies. He has been a board member and donor to a number of nonprofits, an advisor to many publicly traded companies, and a guest speaker at seminars and graduate school courses. But when the opportunity presented itself to pursue his purpose of making school a faster and less expensive process for working adults, he took his shot and he built OnlineDegree.com, which is now partnered with many of the most prestigious universities in the country, saving students time and money. What makes this show particularly interesting, however, is an unexpected and very valuable left turn into a range of highly emotional subjects. In not-so-typical fashion, what began as a business-only podcast rapidly became a therapy session, discussing the value of people, relationships, and so much more. It was really a great and unique show, and I'm thrilled to be resharing it here with you. From episode number 153, all the way back in April of 2020, please join us in welcoming to the show our amazing guest, Grant Aldrich. Hey everybody, welcome to another exciting episode of Eggs. This week we have Grant Aldrich. Grant founded OnlineDegree.com with a purpose-driven mission to make college more accessible and affordable for everyone. After graduating college with an overwhelming amount of debt, he was determined to change how students embark on their college education. Grant has spent his entire career working in startups with nearly 15 years of experience and two prior exits to a publicly traded company. He has been a board member and donor to a number of nonprofits, an advisor to many publicly traded companies, and is a guest speaker at seminars and graduate school courses. Graduated with honors from the University of California, Irvine in economics, and here to talk about all that and so much more is our special guest, Grant Aldrich. How are you, Grant? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, no yeah, problem. of course. Yeah, thrilled to make the time to visit with you. How uh, we? I, I hate that this has to be the opening question all the time, but but in this era, that you know, the post-COVID epoch, you know, we always been or we've been leading with you know, how's it going? How are you holding up? Well, you know, I've got three young children under three and a half, and so I like to joke that my life was sleepless and crazy before. And it still is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's been my biggest thing too. I work from home a lot of the time and, and now I've got my wife and my two boys are here. And so uh, I, I, I just joke that, you know, everything was great. You know, I'm used to working home alone. The biggest problem are my new coworkers. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put that. <laughs> yeah. They're so, very demanding cool. all the time. <laughs> yeah, no joke. Well, and I've got two, they're both in school. So, you know, we've got that going on and my wife teaches school too. So she's teaching and then managing both boys' educations and doing all that stuff while I sit in here and podcast with people. So uh, it's a good time. <laughs> so, yeah. so cool. Well, Grant, let's, uh, I guess, kind of go back to the beginning. Let's talk a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and, and how you got into this line of work. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, this is, this, I, we can go pretty far back. But, um, you know, I, I'm a serial entrepreneur. And I came into my, what I'm doing currently, basically after having a period of introspection and realizing that everything I'd done before was awful. <laughs> I mean, I had to put it to put it like mildly, and uh, and I say that because I'm trying to be as real as possible. You know, I in my prior life I had started two startup companies in my early 20s out of college, and I realized only after the fact that it was it became the antithesis of everything I wanted. I always wanted freedom. And I always wanted to do something I cared about. And I picked, uh, you know, and I, again, it was a great experience. I learned an incredible amount. I, I failed in so many ways that I learned so much after failing after all that period of time. And luckily, by just, you know, I think um, sheer grace, I was able to get a positive outcome and get a couple exits uh, at the end of that for myself, for the shareholders, for the other uh, partners. And it was, uh, it ended well. But, you know, the, even the worst thing that was about to happen was I was about to go on the same path. And I thought that, oh, OK, well, you know, OK, I've had you know, this this um, kind of cathartic event. I got to go bigger, more, uh, you know, uh, bigger company, more employees, all this stuff. And then I'm lucky that I had this period of introspection because after six months, I was able to say, man, I don't want any of that. 
this is awful. I, I'm not happy. I didn't feel like I was free. I'm, I'm a father now and I totally changed my priorities. And I didn't skip to work all day. You know, like I, I, in my prior life, I was working with pharmaceutical companies. And so there's nothing wrong with that, but you don't get excited to make pharmaceutical companies money. Right, like that's Ryan. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I do a lot of work for health insurance providers. So I I, I mean, it's not the same, but it's pretty darn close. Yeah, I get, and and you know what? Again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's totally good, and it's hard. It's hard to do it actually because you have to. I mean, man, so a testament to what you do because you have to navigate a very complex legal framework. Uh, It's competitive. You know, there's all these things that 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 make that part rewarding, right? Anything doing well, done well, is rewarding. So I really got to just completely change and say, I want to do it my way. And that's kind of where I'm at today. And uh, that was with the start of uh, online degree.com. Correct. Yeah. Because how did you, I mean, like, did you just find the domain and like, okay, now I'm going to do education. I mean, why, <laughs> how'd you get into this field? Yeah, no, that it was it, a bit, this was a bit meandering. It didn't start with the domain. It was, um, I was looking for a um, kind of a big vision. Like what, what, what could something I could really tackle? And I, I just kind of kept coming back to education. So part of it, the, and there's a couple different trends or I guess like aspects that made this the case. One was that I had left college with a ton of debt. I went to UC Irvine, which was a public school. So you would think that it would be less expensive, which it was, but it was still expensive. A ton of debt I didn't pay off till later. And then I had, um, my whole family was, um, I, I mean, I came up in a family of educators, so it was always top of mind. Okay. Um, so like, you know, our dinner table conversations were always about education and I looked at the problem and I thought, wow, this is something that's so messed up and is just begging for someone to come in and make it better, which was, you've got all of these million, like, I think it's estimated 35 million adults are not taking the first step towards higher education, despite enormous up, uh, like demand for upskilling and for, um, and to make their lives better, you know, in the face of globalization, automation. And that was before the COVID crisis, right? That before all that, I said, you know, I could do this. And so it was kind of partly the challenge. It was a big enough endeavor that kind of, um, touched everyone that I knew it would be, um, kind of like epic. And that's kind of, kind of how I got to it. And then the, the degree, the online degree domain was really just, crazy negotiating. I, I negotiated <laughs> three months on that domain to finally get it. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, so do you work specifically with the colleges or do you come up with your own material and have your own programs? How, how does online degree work? Yeah. So, um, well, uh, let me just, I guess I should probably describe you, uh, let's just a little context of what we do, which is that, so someone can now come on and in 60 seconds, get started taking as many college level courses as they like for credit towards their degree, no applications, no entrance exams, um, take as many college level courses as they want. And we also get them discounts at the different universities we partner with and we do it all for free. And what's awesome about that is that really it's a modern alternative to the community college. Cause I think all of us would agree, right? Before this, it was, you know, the only way to save was okay, maybe scholarships and community college. Community college is a terrible experience. It's not accessible. It's not online. You still have to get off work and it's not cheap. You know, you still spend a couple thousand dollars a year on community college. I said, you know what? This is a government institution. It's not up to date in the times. We can create a far better platform that really focuses on the experience and make it better for everybody to help bridge them back to college. So So that's the kind of the genesis. Yeah. I went to a community college and uh, I, I went for uh, recording arts and, and uh, you know, it's just, uh, I would go and I'd take the classes and then they would send me home and, and have me work on Linda and, and uh, these other online platforms. And I'm like, well, after about a year and a half of doing it, I was, why am I going to college? I can learn it all on my own. I know what I need to learn essentially all I was going for was to get that piece of paper and I didn't end up getting the piece of paper anyways, because what's the point? I, I got what I needed to out of it and I can learn what I need to on the side from there on. Do you, um, I, I guess what I'm saying is pretty much most of the information's there right now. Any, anything you want to learn, you can go and you can figure it out. You can go and, and most of the, uh, 
pretty much anything you want is available online and you can do it. How much is the piece of paper worth? Is it that important? Do you need it to succeed in life? I've been able to get by without it, but um, in your opinion, do you think the degree is worth it? Do you have to go that route or can you take the Linda approach or the team tree house or the, the, just the online courses that are available? I think you actually brought two really cool points, which is one was like how awful that experience was at the community college, right? To kind of for that, but then two, yeah, you know, is it necessary? And you're right. I think we live in such a fantastic time where all that information's out there for free. Yeah, you're right. If you wanted to go and learn how to do audio engineering, if you wanted to be a butcher, you could learn anything on YouTube or any on those, on those platforms. And it's fantastic. I do that every day. If I'm interested in something, we all do it. But what our platform is different is for the people who, yeah, who do want that degree. And here's the one reality is that, you know, we have a bit, all of us, a bit of a network bias because we're all, we're entrepreneurs. We probably know a lot of other entrepreneurs, but most people aren't. And so you don't need necessarily a degree to be an entrepreneur. Um, but when you, when, when HR companies are surveyed, degrees are still probably if not the top, one of the top factors in getting that job over in a competitive job market over somebody else. And so that's the issue is that, yeah, we still live in a world today where the degree is still king in the, in the workforce. And I'm not even talking about the jobs that, you know, um, are absolutely necessitate having a degree, like a teacher, accountant, right? Where like yeah. you have to, there's a guild. I just mean like, even you're, you're out there getting for a job. It still is that important. But I think you're right. If you want to be, it's not for everybody. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to be a programmer, I could make, you can make a case that maybe you shouldn't go do it. But, you know, I think you guys may have heard, right? Like a lot of big tech companies are no longer saying that a degree is a, um, is a required component to get a job. Mm -hmm. But what they don't say though, if there's two candidates who are very close, it, 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 they, they're going to take the one with the degree. I mean, it, it's an edge and that's the problem. That's true. Well, and I think that's the thing is so many people, you know, sort of try to flee or get around this idea of having to take education, but so much of it has to do with cost. So I think what's really interesting is, you know, maybe your platform uh, and, and the, the way that you work through this helps make school a little bit more affordable for people. Because I think yeah. that honestly, that's so much of the problem, right? I mean, most, uh, most people don't want to accrue the debt. And, you know, depending on the career path you choose, you know, if you go and pay traditional fees, it may be a I don't know, a private college or something someplace, you end up paying so much money and accruing so much debt, and then you never make it back, or you make back, you know, over 25 years in your career. You know, I, I speak, I come from a family of educators, too. And, you know, they're constantly, you know, uh, recertifying and upgrading and, you know, masters and PhDs and blah, 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 all this stuff. And, you know, whole life learning, whole life accruing debt, and, you know, making, you know, an okay wage, but you know, not what you would want with a PhD. No, you're totally right. And I think, I think you nailed it on the head, which is that if you surveyed someone on the street, I think 99 out of a hundred would say like in a perfect world or in a vacuum, sure. I want a degree, but that you're right. That cost benefit, that ROI has been completely thrown off where now people are questioning, why should I do this? Because the cost, the accessibility, all these big factors, that um, tip the scales, that kind of question, is it worth getting? Not, not, you know, not do I want one, but is it worth pursuing? And you're right, that's really the goal is to bring that back into to balance. Because not just from an affordability, because it, it definitely has made it more affordable. I think you know, we could get it at 40% of what it is. It's a big chunk. It's the accessibility too. Like, you know, so back, you know, back to your point earlier was that, you know, yeah, you had to leave work and go down there and to your community college, and then they sent you back home. Well, that's, you can't do that. Like that's, that's a tough thing if you've got kids or a job. And if you're in your, you know, thirties or forties, you really can't justify the cost and those first steps because you can't amortize that debt over a long period of life. Like you can when you're 18. So it's even more critical to have things that are far more accessible. And so when people come off the street, they know about online, but they don't realize there's lots of other ways it can be more accessible to fit your schedule. You can get there. It's just, it's, it, but it's just, it's a, it's a, it's an awareness thing. So with your platform, um, say I want to go back to school, I've got um, 
you know, 90% of my credits done and I want to just go and take the remaining classes. Are you accredited with most of the colleges and I can kind of finish up a degree I already have, or do I have to kind of start from scratch with your program to, to start getting a new one? No. So that I'll give you a better example. Um, so Cause to your, to your earlier question, which was, um, you know, do we, you know, how, do, how does it work with the, with the university? So our courses were all developed in house. And what happens is, is we've got these 15 courses that are, you know, super interesting stuff, like, but they're all introductory. So they're made for someone to take that first step, not necessarily finish upper division. So first step, like, for example, um, we've got a course, intro to programming, intro to robotics, um, history, really interesting, cool stuff. And then what happens is, is a lot of times people will come in and what we do is we go out to these universities we have articulation agreements we create where we map the courses to them and, we, and we'll try to get discounts for the students as well. So like, let's say in that case, you come maybe not with 90% done, but let's say you've got a substantial portion done. You could come on our platform and probably find two or three courses that could still count towards your degree. So you get to knock that off right for free and then take advantage of the degree, um, the discount that we have so that when you do go to that other school to finish, it's at a serious discount. Interesting. What what kind of discounts? Like I I know that you can't get exact, but do you have like a ballpark amount of how much you're actually saving the the clients? No, I get you. I can even tell you some of the exact uh, amounts we get. So it, it varies with each university. So I'll give you an example. At the higher end, we've got schools that like um, University of Maryland, which is their their state system, where they give us twenty five percent off. That's a huge discount. Um, Golden Gate University, forty percent. Um, and then we have a lot of schools that are around the 15 or 10% mark, right? Um, Colorado State, um, uh, you know, I could go on and on and on. We have a lot of partners. And so you can kind of imagine that that's really the sweet spot. I would say on average, it'd be 10 or 15%. Uh, percent. And you may say, well, you know, that's not a huge amount, but it really is when you're talking about ex the expensive degrees. Because normally when you go in to pay for a degree, if you're smart about it, you can take some things, take some things at a community college. I mean, before and maybe, uh, you know, get good, obviously a good, um, uh, government loan and that's the best you're going to do. But now you can take free courses with us. You get a discount. Um, you can also bring in other courses that you may have taken somewhere else. And now you're, you're chipping away huge blocks of, of or huge chunks of cost off that degree. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's super cool. So one of the things that you mentioned sort of at the top, and I, I'd like to maybe spend a little more time about, talking about is sort of this idea of mission driven entrepreneurship. So you mentioned having exited your companies, your prior companies that when you did this, one of the big things you wanted to do was be able to chase down such, something that was passionate to you. And so you mentioned having grown up in a family of educators, and this seemed like a natural step. But I want to talk a little bit about the I guess sort of the, I guess the gumption or the bravery to take a step that is just a passion project, you know, and I, I think everybody sort of aspires to that, right? We all want to do something that's our passion. We all want to chase that down, but so few people do it. And so I wondered if you wouldn't talk a little bit about just sort of that process, making the decision to go this route versus, you know, some other direction. And, you know, I mean, how much of it, was made possible because of prior exits and maybe that set you up financially. So you were able to be a little bit more passionate or something, or would you have done this anyway? That's a good question. You know, I think I would answer that by going one step up first. And I would say that one thing I would suggest every entrepreneur do that I think very few do is to really go through the exercise to know yourself. That's like one of the things I preach, right? Know thyself, the, that ancient Greek maxim. Cause if you know yourself, you know what you're going to be. And again, most people never go through this exercise, sadly, but you realize what makes you happy, what you're good at, what you're not good at. And when I did that for myself personally, I, I came to, you know, a lot of conclusions. One, I like being a bootstrapper. I like, so it's your point about funding it. You know, I, I, I raised money in the previous startup and, um, you know, it's, it, I, and I, I, I just didn't want to have to go that kind of route again. I felt like I'm, Bit more at home in a bootstrap. I think you people are going to be happier doing it that way. Um, and ultimately, I wanted something that was going to I care about. But I, I also think that if you're going to if you're going to be doing your passion, it's sometimes it's very difficult for people to truly figure out how to monetize their passion. Like I talked to another guy recently who said, "Well, my passion is, you know, skiing all day." 
I said, yeah, you might be pretty, that might be pretty hard to come up with a business <laughs> <laughs> that would allow you to do that. Um, but I, I think it needs to be a consideration kind of back to that know thyself where you really take into consideration what is going to be important for your overall everyday happiness. So for example, you may not have to be the thing that is the most passionate about, because I would say that's my family, but it's something I'm definitely very passionate about, right? I, I do care about, because I think that a lot of entrepreneurs, when they go through that exercise, they look at business ideas in a very traditional business sense. Will it make money? Will it scale? Um, how much investment capital do I need? And they, they don't take into consideration like, is this a right role for me? Um, will I even care, you know, what happens with this business or is it just a business? And my, my argument to that would be, this always takes longer than what you think it's done. It's never a two year stint. It's a four year, five year, seven year stint. And so you're going to get burned out if you're not happy going through that. So to me, I know it's a long winded question, but to come back to that, so I think the core of it was I, I wanted to have it be mission focused because I wanted to care about it every day. I needed that for my happiness. Yeah, that makes complete sense. I've actually been down the road where you start learning a topic or going into school and you burn out of that the first course in, the first class. I, I went in and was going to do appraisal, real estate appraisal. Yeah. And about two weeks into it, I realized it's not my thing. And, and you know, I'm, I'm glad I realized it then rather than two years down the road after I went through the whole program. Oh, man, totally agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the thing, if you don't like it, well, then, you know, but I mean, if you'd, I mean, you, you, I, I, you probably feel like you're kind of fortunate, right? Because if you'd been on oh, the yeah. side, oh, yeah. yeah, if I, I you, you raised money, did this big thing, all of a sudden you're locked in with a lot of people's um, expectations for a four year run. Oh, you'd be miserable. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's, it's part of the deal. If you, if you go down that road, you sometimes you just have to ride through it and get past it and, and go on from there. But I, I really like what you're saying about, doing a self analyze, analyze yourself and figure out, you know, am I really going to be happy in this, this, uh, route I'm going and kind of base it off of that. Cause nothing worse than just getting into something and hating it. Well, it's interesting. One of the things that you, you brought up kind of made me think, and it made me wonder if the reason most people don't go after their passion isn't, I mean, cause it's easy to say, I want to do my passion. I want to chase down my passion, but I, I wonder if it isn't, doesn't sort of hinge on what you're saying is that most people don't even know what their passion is. Like, you know, they don't know themselves well enough to do that. Cause I'm just, you know, being a little reflective right here while we're talking. And, you know, I mean, I get really jacked up about things that I'm working on and, and different stuff like that. But I mean, I've never probably taken much of a, a time to really be, you know, analytical or critical. And uh, I wonder if, you know, do you have any, I mean, did you use some kind of platform to do this? Did you just, you know, meet a, a great monk at a coffee shop that helped you out? Or, <laughs> like, how, how did you, uh, did you find yourself? I mean, I see you're out in Irvine, you know, I know how California guys are, but, you know, yeah, I mean, totally. I wonder if maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'm, I'm, I'm just doing like, you know, yeah, yoga all day. And, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I wish there was a uh, kind of an easy path to this because you're right. I think that's what does, come, does kind of come down to it is that we never truly figure out who we are. Well, and I, I, the reason I love that know thyself was because I don't know if um, the listeners will get the background, but in ancient Greece, it was inscribed on the temple of Apollo and which was the temple. He was the God of Paul was the God of wisdom. This was the temple of wisdom. And the Mac and the, and the idea was you, how could you ever a, achieve like, true knowledge if you didn't even know yourself. And that's fascinating to kind of think about that. Like, and that's something that almost all of us just completely neglect. So I don't think there is, I can't really like, as you as you asked that question, it's a good question, nail down like a one easy thing I did, but I did have a traumatic event. I almost died swimming in Northern California. And I think that that put me in a good mindset in addition to this. So after I sold the companies, um, I was out swimming. Uh, I shouldn't have been out there. It was a surf advisory. I'm an idiot. I shouldn't have been out there. And it was really rough. And I got caught. Uh, and I thought, I'm like, man, this is it. I'm done. And a really traumatic event. My wife was on the beach. It was just awful. And, and that also helped aid to this fact where you kind of come with it with a fresh perspective and you say to yourself, well, I'm not going to waste time. This is it. That could have been it. And, and like, I really have to figure out what I want to do to be happy every day. So I think part of it could, as a way to frame this could be, is to have a, almost like an uncompromising attitude that you have to be happy every day. And if you think of it that way, 
you know, you're not going to do a lot of these missteps that we normally will tolerate to get to become successful. Like, for example, um, you know, you wouldn't create a business where you have to be a lot or have a lot of employees if you don't like being a manager. Like that's that's me. I, I'm a terrible manager. Terrible. I don't even like doing it. I'm terrible. I'm not good at it. So I knew I had to do something where I'm just not going to have that. And so I think that because of those things that I put the happiness as a big factor, which again, as we all know, as entrepreneurs, you never do, you never do that. That helps kind of like guide you in all those decisions. Well, and I wonder too, you know, so much of, of what people seem to chase down is a little bit of, you know, living other people's lives or living what they think others might care about or whatever. And I think that takes us just one step further away from that sort of self-recognition and, uh, you know, and understanding what it is that we want because we get so clouded with what everybody else wants that sometimes it's difficult to find your spot. So also, I think you make a good, an interesting point. In your case, it was a life-threatening moment, but you know, I guess the I guess the recovery equivalent would be rock bottom, right? This thing that you hit, where you, you know, hit a low enough low that you can make a decision or that you can pivot. And I, I've been toying around with this idea a little bit that, you know, rock bottom doesn't have to mean rock bottom. Like it doesn't have to mean the bottom of the thing. It just has to mean something that brings awareness to it. And not everybody, you know, I mean, probably for the best, you know, for the better, will have a life threatening problem you know i mean hopefully not anyway yeah. and so but it, but there has to be some sort of mental switch or some sort of something to find that moment or to to have that moment of clarity where you can pivot and start you know looking down a, a path that seems more true or will allow you to make a better judgment call and so and i, I don't know what that is i'm just throwing it yeah. out there as kind of a, an idea around this this idea of that moment allowed you the opportunity to now look clearly and have this new perspective on life. And I, and I feel like there must be a way to hit that without, uh, without, you know, crashing surfing. Yeah. And I think you also, you make a good point about that rock bottom. It doesn't have to mean that you're, you know, destitute eating out of a trash can. That could be very an emotional, personal thing that you feel um, mm -hmm. to make that change. It, it, that's, there's very, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that's right. Well, and also you got to keep into consideration too, that life is just a matter of course correcting as you go. I mean, like you got, you look at the sailors back in the day, they would check their compass and the North star and they'd have three or four different ways to calculate the route. And you just got to have to step back occasionally and look where you're at and say, do I want to be here? Is, is this going to help my end game? Is this going to accomplish my goals and set goals and then go back and, review and make sure you're doing what you're supposed well, to do. And one thing, Grant, uh, I'm not sure, I mean, maybe you intentionally said it, maybe you didn't, but it, right at the top of the conversation, you mentioned having failed a lot and having learned a lot from that. And I think that that's one of those things too, you know, that so many people are afraid of or there's stigma around is this idea of failure. And so I wonder if you maybe you couldn't elaborate a little bit on just sort of the value of failure in sort of building businesses, founding companies, even getting to the point of an exit, you know, just like, what did were what were you able to learn that you wouldn't have otherwise learned? You know, had you not failed, I guess. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that kind of what I've chosen to do now is a culmination of that failure. Because if I look back and I ask myself, what was the greatest failure of my early twenties or, or my my twenties, my early thirties? Because I'm almost forty now. It would have been that um, I got off track just kind of and back to your compass analogy, right? That I wasn't looking down at that compass. I just left the shore and never thought to do it. And, uh, and what is that? And how does that manifest itself? Well, what it does was it, it made me unhappy because my goal from the very beginning, even as a little kid, just to kind of take a step back is that I always wanted freedom and I didn't want money. Like the joke always was that if I made a million dollars, I wouldn't know where to spend it. And that's still true. I have no idea. Like, cause I don't care. Like to me, it's just, I just want unfettered ability to do whatever I want. And so if you want that, and what I found in my part of my early career was that I ironically became a slave in pursuit of that freedom. And cause I looked at freedom being something you attain at the end of some long journey, as opposed to just living it every day. Mm -hmm. And now it's easy to say, right, as long as you, cause like, obviously I was able to have enough food where I wasn't starving and, you know, I, I, you know, you have to have a certain threshold, but that really is a, a true thing. And so when I look at those failures, I kind of look at the fact that I wasn't listening to myself. And I think that it all stems from that. Cause then when you get into like the business failures, I mean, we could talk for days. <laughs> I could go over all kinds, I could run like, you know, I could talk for days on business failures that I've reflected on and like money that was poorly spent, um, bad decisions that I should have known better. Uh, 
um, you know, how to trust, like, like not trusting certain vendors. All those things are great stories, but I think they're almost trivial in a sense to the greater happiness of like what you should be doing, if that makes any sense. No, it, I actually kind of lived that lifestyle. Like I've, I've, money's kind of second for me. Um, uh, granted, I chase it. I, I go after business opportunities when they come, but um, I've kind of, you know, I've been a DJ for 20 years. I just kind of, I work in Lake Chelan because I like going to the lake and, and doing weddings there. And I like, you know, it, I just kind of follow, you know, what I like first and then hopefully the money comes with it. And sometimes it doesn't. And that's when you go and you get a part-time job driving a truck just to you know, help out with that. But yeah, um, well, you know, I'll tell you what's really kind of cool about that. So when I was um, in my twenties and I started my for one of the things I'm most thankful for, this is kind of also a little incitement, uh, insightful is uh, when I was in my early twenties, just got a college, started that new startup, you know, we weren't making anything. Just it was it was like it was bare bones for years, right? Because and, and and I was willing, I think, to be miserable to do that because like you you think you can sacrifice. And again, I think that was also being a bit of um, uh, you know just a, a novice in the entrepreneurial world, I'm not questioning. Oh, maybe is the business model wrong? Because it was. But regardless, <laughs> it made me live uh, a very meager lifestyle. And it kind of also reinforced that money shouldn't be the most thing, thing we chase. And so I, I became, like I lived um, like a very simple Spartan lifestyle. I didn't, you know, I just, I just tried to enjoy every day. I really enjoyed learning, but I didn't really go out and do a lot of stuff financially. Like I, I had friends who would be buying boats and stuff like that, going like the Leia. I just never did it. I'd like to go do it. I think that was one of the most valuable things you can learn as an entrepreneur is to keep your expenses low. Because if you keep your expenses low in your personal life and your business life, you know, your, your stress level stays so well. Because like you said, man, like you can go do it and then you get to go do whatever you want and be happy. And you don't have to worry about this big rent or, you know, insert whatever that big purchase is that stresses you out and creates urgency to do things you don't want to do. Right, because you're comfortable where you don't have to chase that money for that other job that you don't, that gig you don't want or move to an area you don't want to because you're comfortable. You're, you're happy where that that is. That's awesome. So, like for me, even after the exit, where like it wasn't like you know stratosphere, but my lifestyle didn't change. Like I, you know, I, I, I'll tell people what car I drive. I drive a Honda. I drive a Honda Odyssey because it's practical. I like it. And I, it makes works with my kids. Um, you know, it 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 didn't change me. I think that was a big that was a big deal. Yeah. Is it Warren Buffett that drives like the old sixties truck or did <laughs> yeah. or something? You hear the stories of the guys that have million dollars and their car's just like a Pinto, you know? And it, yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's like the guy I used to work for this guy named Don Aslett. He, you know, for you would, you would have assumed he was some kind of crazy homeless guy, but meanwhile, <laughs> you know, pretty rich dude. And, and, you know, but he showed up to work every day in his painter's gear, you know, ready to go paint stuff and, you know, covered in, whatever and just you know brutal but but yeah i mean so much of it had to do with just him like the money was secondary or tertiary or e even further down the line you know he none of that really yeah. mattered to him and so and, and i think that goes back to our, our overall you know what's become our topic is this uh, happiness that, that's it right because and, and and i'm, I'm gonna kind of transcend upon that because ultimately you're right it always comes down to your own happiness but how cool is it by the way the guy who comes in that room who doesn't care, like in terms of like looking at like a model, because we always look at the models, the guys who've got all the flashy stuff right on TV and all these things. But the guy who shows up like that, your boss, or like Sam Walton, where I remember Sam Walton was quoted that uh, it's nice to be the wealthiest guy in the room and drive the worst car, right? Yeah. And because uh, he, he, he built, he even when uh, Walmart was going to billions, I think he was driving his old pickup truck. Right. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, like you look at that guy and then that guy has got serious character. Right. When you look at those guys who are like seriously like Warren Buffett. Where man, he just lives like that. I mean, dude, good for you. And that is fantastic. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. There's maybe some parallels going on right now. You know, we're in the midst of this COVID-19 outbreak. Most of us are sequestered to our homes, things like that. Um, I'm finding, you know, we're spending a lot less money. Um, you know, and obviously there's a spectrum here, right? They, I mean, we're doing okay, but there are people who obviously still are working in the factories or doing things, you know, because they have to make ends meet. So I understand that this is a pretty, um, uh, a, you know, a perspective of somebody who's maybe doing better than some of the others. 
But, um, but I know that like in our own family, we've tightened up quite a bit. We're being much more mindful of the resources we're using when it comes to, I mean, everything from toilet paper to the food we're cooking and, you know, we're eating a lot of leftovers and we're doing all this stuff. And, you know, we're also spending a lot of time doing the things that I think most of us, you know, back to, or to circle back to sort of your idea of chasing freedom or, you know, that it was something you could attain. I think now most of us are, you know, or many of us anyway, are back home with families. They're spending time, so it, you know, with wives and kids and stuff like that. You know, people who normally have day jobs and normally go to school all day and normally do this and that. And now all of a sudden you're in each other's space all day and you're getting all the things that, you know, you sort of put off until retirement. And now here you are in the prime of your working years and you're able to do this. And I, I'm curious to see what will happen when we, when we sort of circle back to whatever the new normal will be. Uh, how many people go running back to that, you know, entrepreneurial lifestyle or that, that 40 hour work week or, or plus where they're, you know, out there grinding the clock, chasing something down when they go, you know what, we just had it. Like we just, we have it right now. Like what, what are we running for? So I'm yeah, curious to see really, how it goes. Yeah, that's a really good point. You're right. Cause I think, I think you're right that there's going to be these reactions. Like, like, I mean, especially let's say we get into quarantine in like June, right? Mm -hmm. Very wild reactions on both sides, people who just cannot wait to get away from that family environment or the people, like you said, who kind of have that epiphany that, yeah, that I think that would like your, 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 your uh, analogy to retirement is a good one, that this is kind of what this could be like. And how cool would that be? I, I got to I want to change what I'm doing. I want to work. Well, it home. seems like a great opportunity to reshuffle priorities, right? I mean, like, you know, and I, of course, there are people who have horrible home lives and, and aren't looking to stay there. There are young people who want to get out and travel and do things like that, you know, but people sort of our age, they have a couple of kids, they're chilling out in family. Like, you know, the, the ability to spend this time with friends and family now, well, family specifically, keep your social distance and all that stuff. Um, you know, the, this opportunity to spend time with family is something that, you know, like, you know, you work your 40 hour a week for so that you can hang out with them on the weekend. Right. And, you know, and now here you are, you're just working out all day together, <laughs> you know, <And> so, <laughs> you know, for, bad, for good or for bad. I mean, there may be plenty of people that run back to their office, but, but, uh, no, but I do think it's interesting, you know, cause it is one of those sort of things. Like if you're, if you're putting together sort of a, a group of, of things to chase after like freedom, you know, financial independence, some of these other things that are sort of the common topics that people are chasing after, you know, one of them is time with family. You know, a lot of people really, you know, aspire to that. And now that you're getting it sort of, you know, at no cost, like, hey, you're forced, you have to go stay home. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see what effects this has, you know, I assume short term people will be maybe a little reticent or maybe a little more appreciative of what they have. Long term, I'm, I'm afraid we'll slip back into old habits and kind of get back to work. But but uh, but I, I, nonetheless, I think it's an interesting time and, you know, interesting observation that just, you know, we're living these things and we're doing it with less, you know, expenditure, less time on the road, less everything. And, uh, you know, to your point about sort of being, I guess, a little bit, you know, coming up a little more meager or not having, you know, a, the business not making any money and you're having to kind of strap it, you know, bootstrap from meal to meal or whatever is, uh, you know, I think that's a really good characteristic. And I think a lot of people are experiencing that now. So I think we'll find how much more we could have gone without or how much excess we have. Yeah, I think you're right. And, uh, you know, you know what I think it'll actually come out of it. Well, I'm hoping we come out of it is that people kind of go through that introspection and are willing to defy common convention of what our lives are supposed to be like, right? Because, I mean, we, we can't deny that we're heavily influenced by the normal lifestyle, I'm gonna call it normal, like kind of lifestyles that everybody lay, leads. Like you said, 40 hours a week, we go to work, we spend the time with the weekend, with the family, that's normal. And, but we always think that if we're wealthy, we can transcend that. But you don't, you can transcend that right now and not be wealthy. Like I'll give you an example. There's a family that I love watching on YouTube because I feel that they have a very similar philosophy to my own. If you guys go in, if you ever have any, uh, go onto YouTube and type up, type in, Gridlessness is the channel, or it's called the Birkinshaw family. And this family is awesome. This family, these, this couple with their four daughters bought 20 acres in the Canadian wilderness for like 20 grand. And they live up there total, they're normal people, they're funny, they live, they have a they have a really nice life for them, but they don't, they work, they just play full time. Like because they don't really need that much money to survive. So they enjoy this rich life with their children, rich life doing all these projects, having a great time. And most of it's outdoors, but they do a lot of fun stuff. 
stuff that you would love to do. And they're just normal people, but they were able to have that, um, the philosophy and the idea that they could cut their expenses and, and, and knew what was going to make them happy. And they did it. And they're, they're not millionaires. In fact, the quite the opposite. It's, it's incredible. I would, I, I'd say, check it out. Well, I'm actually, <laughs> I'm literally looking at property to do something like that with, and I've been looking for different sources of income that you can, like you can raise pigs, no joke, and make 50 grand a year rotating pigs from acre to acre. And like, I've done the math on it and I've, I've done like, I don't know. I just, I, what you're saying right now is kind of like the lifestyle I kind of want to live. I love just getting in and doing a hard day's work and seeing the results of what that work came out of and uh, the thought of having, you know, my own 20 acre little ranch and being able to live and subs- and make money off of the property and just work that property full time is my dream right now. And, uh, yeah. you know, I just think it's really cool. <laughs> Amen, man. That is awesome. Because you're right. You could tell. And plus, you know, you're obviously very savvy from an internet perspective. So really the world is your oyster to kind of make your time to do it. Right. Like where in addition to that, if you ever wanted to, you could also supplement that with like a distance kind of um, career gig, whatever you want. Cause you do, yeah. I love it. You're right. I'm actually thinking about the same. Like we, um, I don't think we would go to the Northern British Columbia <laughs> forest, but yeah, now I'm thinking beach in Mexico, but <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's probably pretty cheap right now. Uh, yeah. But you know, the man, that is like you, I think all of us would agree. That's a bold move. And yet if you really think about that, it's so like, I don't know. I love it. I, I, I'm trying to take steps to do that as well. Like I, that's where I want to take the family is that I want to get away from a lot of this. And then like, yeah, I go back and forth between Vegas and California and California is insane. The only reason I'm still here is because I've got family here and there's nothing I can really do if I want to keep my kids with the family. So, you know, I tolerate it, but I don't, I'm, I'm trying to like engineer a plan to do exactly what you said, you know, get out to an area where you could have that kind of lifestyle, no stress. Yeah. It just is so appealing to me just to, you know, set your schedule, do what you want to do. You have your list of chores. And if you can make money doing it, why not? You know, why have some job you have to report to? Why have, you know, the nine to five and the daily grind that you just hate, you know, just set up your life the way you want to live and live it. I don't know. It yeah. seems pretty no, simple. True. Yeah. <laughs> well, that it, takes courage. Yeah. 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 I mean, of course, it's so easy to say that, right? It's the it's the follow through that makes it tricky. But I, I think, you know, it's like anything. I think if you're intentional about it, you can just about make anything happen. And, uh, you know, it's difficult to find that intention sometimes. And it is difficult to, you know, overcome some of the challenges that may come up. But, you know, so not to discount any of that. But I think that, um, you know, I mean, you can just about make work anything you want to make work if you, if you really care enough about it. Yeah. Well, in <laughs> You know, the last little bit that we've been talking on the back of my mind is the the last year I spent running that recording studio. Um, I, I essentially I created a job that I didn't really like, and I we we've yeah. So Grant, just to give you a little bit of background, <laughs> yeah, we yeah. Uh, so our we're now you know doing this obviously remotely. Mike's up in Idaho. I'm down in Salt Lake City. Um, for the last year, year and a half, we've had a studio here in Salt Lake City that we were running and, and we had basically brokered a deal with uh, a, the guy who owned the building. He set us up with a little spot and, you know, it, we had tried to basically build a, an opportunity for Mike as an engineer to run a full blast podcast studio down here. Okay. And it was, you know, super sick. It was really cool. It was great to be able to just sit down and plop in and record and do your thing. You know, it was great. But, you know, uh, the emotional baggage you know, is the stuff I think Mike's alluding to. And, and so, and, uh, you know, Mike, go ahead and finish your story, but I think it's a, a pursuit of happiness tale. A hundred percent. Like, uh, you, you were talking about taking outside funding and taking, you know, um, how the, this time around you're bootstrapping. And this time I, I was beholden to the landlord. I was doing all this other stuff. I was trying to generate work and really, I didn't really, the the thought was I, I went to school for recording arts to be a better DJ, but I got this degree that I, uh, you know, can man, manipulate audio and record and do all this stuff. And what a better time to do it for podcasting. And then you get into it and you realize I like podcasting, but I don't like doing it for other people. I like yeah. doing, you know, I like doing my thing and, you know, this random fitness podcast or this or whatever, it just, 
it had its cool points, but essentially I created a job for myself. I had to be there for studio hours. I had to be there for this. I had to be there for that. And it just, the stress that came along with doing it just left a really bad taste in my mouth. And I'm kind of at the point and I'm at, I'm, in, I'm at a pivot point right now. Like I've literally, I, I closed this down. Um, I'm doing lawns, lawn care right now to, to supplement my DJ income because COVID kind of knocked that into reality. And so now I'm at a point in my life where I'm like, I got to decide what I want to do. And I'm literally, I'm, I'm, I'm at a point where I'm, I'm going to go and, and take the, the path that I, that I want and make my life, you know, matter to me and the, the rest will follow is kind of where I'm at. And, and I just, you know, this conversation is kind of, brought that to the forefront again but it's been my thinking for the past little bit is i'm not gonna i'm not gonna be working for someone else i'm gonna be doing what i want to do and yeah grant in case it's not clear mike is a rolling stone he doesn't work very well (laughs) if you put him in his spot so he's he's chasing his freedom too so i think that's uh you know a really good parallel i'm glad we're having this chat yeah sorry tangent (laughs) well no man you're right and by the way like isn't it amazing how like you said it it, it didn't happen all of a sudden it it kind of started i'm sure as like a a cool idea and then it just somehow it starts to snowball and all of a sudden you just blink and it's you're in a situation where you're not that comfortable and you're like dude man how did this happen the hell happened yeah and i totally get it and you know what's crazy is that only and again I'm not, I'm not the best at this. I'm, 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 because I, I think that you have to kind of do this all the time. Like you're back to your analogy with the compass, right? You always have to be kind of knowing where you go. Only, only if the only thing that probably would have gotten you even like, if you look back out of that situation is if you had such a clear idea of what you did want, that it was easy to swat flies and say, no, no, no. Cause otherwise we do tend to bend and mold and be accommodating and all those things for whatever that idea is. You know what yeah. I mean? Well, yeah. so t- tell me what your thought is on Grant, on this grant. And sorry, this has turned into like this total like uh, hippy dippy kind of you know uh, <laughs> therapy sesh. This is kind of I mean it's kind of fun. I hope you don't mind. But um, so I I wonder if you have any thoughts about this. I've had I've had some thoughts too as I've arrived at a lot of these same, sort of same theories or ideas about sort of life and existentialism and just where we are and what everything means and all this. You know, how much of it do you think has to do with age, life, and experience. Like, you know, I, I just turned 40 this year. So you and I are probably similar in age, you know, more or less within a couple of years. Mike's, you know, a couple of years younger than me too. And, uh, you know, but I, I feel like there's no way to know all this stuff that we're talking about. These things to do with, you know, I mean, yeah, there's business failures and you become more savvy at business. There's, you know, life failures and you become more savvy at life, you know, all these different things. But like, I think it's kind of impossible to have known any of this without just putting in the time. Like I sort of feel like you have to arrive at 30 or 40 before you have any of this kind of wisdom, you know? And it's not not even wisdom, it's just you kind of wake up and kind of realize one day. And, uh, yeah, but yeah, I yeah. think so much of it's time served. I totally, I totally agree with you. Cause you know, it's, it's weird. It's been in front of us our whole lives. Cause you're right, we're all the same age. It's been, and by the way, that the whole about existential mortality, I don't know if you guys can see this. I keep this up here to remind <laughs> me that of every day. It's a skull every day, I look at that, yeah. like, I, your time's limited. Um, but you're right, man. Like, if you think about it, I started to realize that all old people, right? Guys in their 70s, 80s, 90s, regardless of their socioeconomic background, religion, culture, whatever it is, they typically always tell you the exact same bits of, of wisdom, right? It all comes down to about the same, which is, man, time flies fast. Um, you know, uh, uh, health is important. You know, these little nuggets that are like gold at the very end. And so to your point, we hear them our whole lives, but we don't pay attention. (laughs) And so only when we've, I think, realized in our 30s and 40s that, man, this is hard. I gotta go, you know, this is, and like, this is almost over that you finally and sadly kind of get these lessons. Cause I don't think our parents probably would have, even if they did, would we have listened? Well, I think one of the things that's been interesting, or at least, and maybe Mike, this is your your experience too, you can jump in. But my, sort of my experience with like, just like this podcast, for example, is so we're 150 episodes in, so 150 consecutive weeks, minus a couple, we've interviewed somebody who is a CEO or a professional or a songwriter or an artist or whatever, right? 
And so we, we've had a million great interviews with a million awesome people, all with different backgrounds, different walks of life. And, you know, we have this conversation, right? We talk about these things and we, we arrive at a lot of these little, I, I don't know if they're moments of truth or little facts about life or whatever, you know, like, but we find that there's a lot of similarity between people, right? And then the other end of this spectrum is sort of the, the younger people I see out and around who are seeking knowledge on the internet. And they're looking for quick ways to solve problems. They're looking for somebody to just tell them what to do or how to do something. And, uh, and what's occurred to me is, is this thing about age that it just, you, you almost just have to get there. Like you're just, nobody, everybody can tell you whatever you want. You can watch as many YouTubes as you want. And, and, I, I don't think it's the same with like skills, right? Like I might learn how to, I don't know, sculpt clay or something from watching a YouTube video. But when it comes to something like sort of philosophy on life or how, how to best move forward or how to understand priorities, um, I, I just think you have to get there. I, I don't even know that, the, you know, all this advice that people espouse is, is even worth, you know, that. Because I spent a lot of years chasing that kind of information. You know, how do I get this? How do I learn this? And I've just found in the last few years, even maybe from 36 to now, that I've started really coming into my own on some of these understandings, assuming there are more down the road. But the needs of a, a 30 year old or almost, you know, almost then 40 year old, now 40 year old. Um, you know, I've, I've come into so many things like you, you mentioned legacy and your little skull back there. You know, I mean, my dad died when I was really was youngish and he was really young. And so I've always carried this weight that, oh, well, I guess I'm just going to die young, too. It just is what it is. And I've noticed in the last few years that I've really pivoted from me and my woe is me and, oh, I'm going to croak and this whole thing. And it's become, well, what happens if I do croak? What about my kids? Who's going to generate income to keep this family afloat? Who's going to, you know, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, what happens to the house and the business and the kids and the wife? And, you know, and I've just noticed that the priorities have changed. And I don't know that you could have been prepared for that by, you know, some YouTube video you watched. I think I think you just have to kind of arrive at that age to get it. Yeah, I think you actually said a lot of things that are important because you're the first one I'll talk on the last one is that you're right. When you're a father or mother, whatever, um, it does change that, right? That the stress and like the thought of that, because now it's not just you, right? Like uh, you are responsible for that. And you're right. That kind of weighs pretty heavily on you. It dictates a lot of your decisions. Um, but, you know, actually, but I think you brought the right context because I think, you know, looking at that, you're, you're asking, I think the right question, which is that, is there any hope to distill any of this and how do we educate younger people about it? And I've, I've gone through this exercise only in as much as what am I going to tell my children? Right. And I, the way that I did is I, I've been writing them a letter and it's a long, long, this is a long process. Right. But I'm basically sure. trying to distill everything in there. So for the event that you're talking about that, hopefully I'm going to teach them this their whole lives. But if something happens to me, here's a blueprint you should follow. And I think that's the only exercise I've done to kind of take all this. And like you said, and it does like, I, and I know we've already hammered this home, but I really kind of came back to it that the best playbook I can give you is that you just have to be happy. And that from day one, and then I, I gave, you know, and then I, the way I broke it down was that here are some things that I feel are the pillars of happiness that you can ignore at your own peril, but that these are going to be very important. And then basically the best thing we can do is give them that playbook and just influence them at the margins where they don't make big errors. Like for example, one of my pillars is health. Hey, everybody, every old person you're going to talk to is going to say it. And if you mess up with your health at the end, you're going to be miserable for the last 30 years of your life. You're going to be unhappy no matter what you're doing. So don't do stuff that's going to put your health at risk, right? Would be the, the moral case for that. So um, I think it's the best we can do because you're right. Ultimately, everybody's going to be their own life and you can just try to give them that framework in my mind. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, and Ryan too, um, you're, when you're 20, your priorities are a lot different than when you're, you know, 30, 35, 40, your life changes. And it, it just goes back to that compass, you know, finding, you know, as things change, you got to redirect and realign and stay true north to you. And yeah, kind of well, and that's the thing is, you know, just to kind of bring it back, you know, or maybe to try and put a period on this, <laughs> this bit is, um, you know, the, this compass idea, what I, what I really like about it is something that I always say is just basically the path is there's no path. And so, and it does go back to this idea of chasing everybody down and trying to, you know, get advice from every expert you can find and all this stuff. And, you know, the, the reality is that there just isn't a path. Like you're looking for someone to give you a map, but there's not a map, you know? 
And so, uh, so I think you're right, Mike, that it's, you know, it's following your compass and following your understanding and whatever it is that makes you happy. Like that's just gotta be it because there's not another way. There isn't yeah. some other way, you know, and, and what's that? One. Yeah. That's a, good way, mean, that's a good way to distill it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. Well, and, and that's the thing. I mean, I have to use this little phrase all the time. This, uh, it's taken every decision I've ever made to get to this moment to try and keep myself from having regret about going the wrong path or taking the wrong things. I think about it more like this big, long, meandering road. And the only way I got to this conversation is by 40 years of choices, you know? And so I think uh, by doing that, it allows me to sort of go, okay, well, there was no, no wrong turn, you know, like there was no other way to get here. And so uh, I, I think that that helps for what it's worth. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good way to, that's a good way to look at it too, so, right? Can't cool. go back in time. Well, I guess, I mean, we sort of burned our hour being, you know, armchair th- uh, philosophers, <laughs> but, but let's, I mean, let's sort of go out strong on, on talking about online degree real quick. Let people know um, a little bit about, I guess, maybe just sum up the process, how we get started working with online degree, how does a person who's interested in chasing down a degree, you know, in pursuit of their own happiness, how do they, you know, get started with online degree and, and, and get the whole thing going? Yeah, you know, if we if we can be helpful, and uh, you know, and and I think a lot of times people have, you know, what you know what I actually think we, we do the best is if you're a working adult, which is really what this was for, guys like us, people like us, and you want to go back to school, you have a ton of anxieties that prevent you from doing so, physical, uh, you know, physical impediments, psychological anxieties, and you know. What's nice about our platform it allows you to wade into the pool rather than jump in. So instead of like, okay, I'm going to go immediately right now and roll. No, no, no. Hey, right now you can go start taking some courses. Do you have the time management? You know, do you, do, is it interesting for you? Right? Like you get to take a few courses, like with Mike's example, instead of just jumping into a full program to see, man, do I, am I even like this career? Um, you get to wade into the pool, low stress. Hey, you, you get a bad grade. Doesn't matter right? Uh, now, if you pass the course, great. It'll count co- towards your degree, but it's a low stress environment to try to see and take that first step to make your life better. And if we can play a part in that journey, awesome. And so, yeah, it's, you know, obviously domainsonlinedegree.com. You can follow the project. It's pretty cool. Um, but again, you know, and, and if, but if someone just wants to go learn something on YouTube, that's great too. You know, I think I, I think our real um, positioning in the market is if you want to get, is the, is the, is the, degree is the goal and the outcome that's where we can help well and i think that's a a good approach for that as well because if if your degree is essential to you this is a good way to save money while doing it and getting it i mean 20 percent. i mean that adds up when your your total bill is 30 40 grand so uh makes a difference so uh thanks for making the time for us and uh yeah, Grant, any, any parting shots or, or places where people can uh, track you down online or, or just onlinedegree.com? Yeah, you can check out the, uh, they can follow the project there. And then, um, you know, I'm, I'm usually pretty big on like active on LinkedIn. It's like the one social media I actually enjoy, right? Kind of following. Right. So if you if you go to LinkedIn, you can just search Grant Aldrich or onlinedegree.com. Grant, I'll be the only one that pops up. And uh, yeah, go ahead and friend me on there. I'll uh, keep in touch with whatever you know, the person's doing, vice versa. Cool. That's great. Well, thanks so much. Like Mike said, I uh, really appreciated the conversation. This is, I mean, a different direction than I anticipated going, but uh, but hopefully it wasn't too bad for you. I, I had some fun doing that. No, man, I really enjoyed the time. Yeah, thank you, guys. So, cool. Well, thanks so much, man. And uh, thanks for everybody who downloads every week and for tuning in and listening. And we love you all and find your happiness. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you all next time.